Welcome to the Leadership Purpose with Dr. Robin podcast. I'm your host, Robin L. Owens, PhD. And this is where we dive in each week to give advice, tools, and tips for high achieving, purpose minded women who've written nonfiction books and want to amplify their message beyond the book. I'm a college professor, and when I'm not doing that, I am speaking, coaching, mentoring, and teaching high achieving women who have written books how to use their books to make a bigger difference, have more impact and purpose. Okay, let's dive in. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Leadership Purpose with Dr. Robin podcast. We're so glad you're here and listening into the podcast and how you help make us rank in the top 10% of all podcasts globally, according to Listen Notes. So really appreciate you for taking time out of your busy day in life and listening into the podcast. And today I am talking with Dr. Marisol Capellan. Now, let me tell you about Marisol, Dr. Marisol. She is an internationally recognized and award-winning educator, a TEDx speaker, executive coach, and corporate trainer. She is the founder of the Capellan Institute, which is a leadership coaching and corporate training company specializing in workplace culture, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I mean, Dr. Marisol has so many, so many accolades, but let me just tell you a little bit more about her. And for our purposes here today, I want to highlight her book. She is the author of the book, Leadership is a Responsibility. Already, I have 25 questions. Leadership is a, <laughs> leadership is a responsibility. Uh, and she'll say more about that when we get into the conversation. Uh, let me see. I'll leave her introduction there and let her say more. And right now I will say, welcome, Dr. Marisol Capellan. Thank you so much for having me here, Dr. Robin Owens. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to speak with you today. And I hope your listeners gain a lot of value from our conversation. Okay, I'm sure they will. Thank you for that. And, you know, there's so much rich, uh, good stuff about you and your bio and your background. And I just gave them just a little bit to introduce. But why don't you tell us in your own words about who you are and what you do? So I am an Afro-Latina. I live in Miami. I do public speaking, corporate training on diversity, equity, and inclusion, leadership. Um, I started my career a few years ago. I mean, I don't want to say a few years ago, years and years, years ago, I've been working since I was 16. I came to the United States at 16 and I'm from the Dominican Republic and I came here, did my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, my doctoral degree. I became the first person in my family with graduate degrees. So here we are breaking generational uh, you know, things that have happened in our family, such as, you know, education levels and things like that. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, it sounds like you uh, are very accomplished and you've made a lot of uh, a lot of educational advancements as I'm listening to you talk about that. So tell us more about, let's start with what your, I mentioned it a little bit in your introduction about your company and the work your company does. So my company, I founded my company because I felt that there was a need for inclusive leadership and real authenticity as it comes to corporate responsibility. So, you know, a lot of companies are, you know, they're proclaiming that they want to do more things to advance society or to help minorities or to, um, you know, care for the environment and things are important to us. However, when you look inside the organization, sometimes inside the organizations, they, they, they're they not implementing what they preach. So if you care about DEI outside of your company, how are you implementing DEI inside the company? How are you having those conversations? How are you making sure that people are safe in your company, that they feel like they belong? And sometimes in order for you to do that, you have to understand the people that you're working with. And you have to make sure that people have a space to speak, to learn, to grow. And all all of that goes back to having, you know, psychological safety inside your company. I've always been very passionate about mindset. I'm a coach. Mindset, um, 
confidence in yourself, personal growth. And then I've also been very passionate about teaching leadership and management and human behavior. So basically, my company does a combination of those two things. You have empowerment, a lot of self-talk, a lot of realizations about who you are and how are you impacting your work in society. And also it has the practical approaches to leadership and to inclusion that a company should model in order for them to be socially responsible about the effect they have in society. Yes. And that's important work, really important work. And you mentioned uh, mindset and that, that work, it sounds like you have um, some experience, some personal experience, uh, or is, was there something that was a catalyst that kind of helped you shift your mindset or do the work that you teach others? Yes. Oh, that's such a great question. So yes, mindset is very important to me. So when I came to the U.S. Uh, after four months of living here, I was on my own. I was homeless at one point. And when you're going through a lot of difficulties, you only and you only have yourself. So I was on my own here. My whole family was back in the Dominican Republic. And you have to and you have goals. So I always had very big goals. How do you get out of bed when like sometimes you have chaos around you and what you perceive as chaos, right? Because it's not what we see is the meaning that we attach to those things. So if I'm attaching the meaning of my situation as this is a failure or this is bad or this is you know, I feel shameful because I'm in this situation and you have that shame or that bad feeling, but at the same time, you have big goals, big ambitious goals. Like how do you move from here and and achieve those goals despite all of those shortcomings, right? Despite not having resources, despite not having, you know, support, despite not having like a, a shoulder to cry on, like how do you do that? And it has to do a lot with mindset. And one of the catalysts, I think, for me to understand, I mean, a lot of things happen, but I just remember one time that I was going through a terrible time and I didn't go to work for like two days. And those, I think, were the only times that I didn't, I missed work because I don't remember a day that I missed work. Even my last job, I never missed work for for the whole entire time that I worked there. Not that, you know, you should take care of yourself, mental health. I understand all of that. This is Mental Health Awareness Month. But I'm telling you just to give you a, a context of mindset. So I didn't go to work for two days. And then what happened What happened was that, that week, I didn't make enough money. So it really set me back for the extra weeks. So I said, it's the same thing with your mind. I'm like, the time that you did, and the time that you're sad or you're looking at things a negative way or the, the time that you use really not working on your mindset and being negative about certain things is going to hold you back. It's going to prevent you from achieving your goals as fast as you could because you're spending that much time like in your mind. So sometimes, you know, those are some of the things, but I have so many stories about mindset and that helped me a lot. Even though I was going through that, I graduated with honors. Even though I was going through a lot of challenges, I continued. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm like, I'm not made of rock. I'm not a robot. But there are certain moments in your life where you have to make a decision. Mm. And sometimes you can live with your head and sometimes you can live with your emotions. Sometimes it's not even that you feel bad about the situation. You're thinking that the situation is bad and it's going around in circles and your mind is overpowering everything else. So you have to know self-awareness is super important. Yes. And the reason why I ask that question is because, I mean, I'm, I believe it. I believe that self-awareness is critical for personal and professional well-being and success. And mindset, I think, governs just about everything, in my opinion. So mm -hmm. glad to hear you say that. Now, you were talking about how that difficult situation and losing those that time at work. Did you develop some strategies or skills along the way that you could now recognize and use whenever you need them in terms of shifting your mindset? Yes, yes. I love that question, too, because not only do I use some of these techniques, but I also teach it when I go and teach my clients. Right. And it, and it depends. Like you have some strategies that you use as a person and then some strategies that you use to better your relationships because sometimes the chaos is happening about the way that you develop relationships with other people. So how do you do that? But sometimes what 
the biggest thing we have to do, like one of the things that helped me with my mindset is if I'm, if I'm feeling bad about something or I feel like I cannot do something or I feel like I'm not competent enough to do certain things, I have to not shame myself from for having those feelings. And sometimes we shame ourselves. We think like, oh, I shouldn't be angry about this or I shouldn't feel sad about this or I shouldn't feel shame about this. You telling yourself that you shouldn't is just going to energy or or like just keep the feeling around. And sometimes the feeling, what it needs is a little bit of acknowledgement and say, okay, I understand. I know why I feel shame about this or I know why I feel uh, I have feel the imposter syndrome and I feel like I cannot, I'm not enough. Like I understand where that comes from. Let me acknowledge that. And it's like a little child. After you acknowledge your emotions, now they're calm. <laughs> There's no <laughs> tantrum. And then you say, okay, so I cannot, I feel like I, I was an imposter. I feel like I cannot complete this task. You can, a task, you can acknowledge it and then challenge it. Why don't I feel like I can complete this task to the best of my ability? Why is it? Because sometimes you will find that those sentiments are not even based on factual evidence, right? Mm. So if I start asking myself, well, why can't I? And I have an answer such as, which I've heard from some of my clients, and I have to like battle those limiting beliefs with them. One of the excuses might be because I have an accent, right? And then you have to ask yourself, well, is it true that no one who has an accent can complete this? to the best of their abilities, that's a lie. So it's a total lie. Is that that limited belief, you may have those limiting beliefs because you witnessed things growing up or you heard it from somebody else or you met somebody who felt bad about that specific part of themselves and then you adopted that as your own. So you have to really examine it and also challenge it, well, accept it, examine it, challenge it, and then pick a new belief system and make sure that, you know, after you realize that that belief system may not be based on factual evidence, then you can choose a different thought. And you can say, well, I know with my accent that I will deliver the best training ever, right? So then how do you make that thought a reality? Then it's the next part, which is like, what will make it the best training ever? What, what do I need to have? So that's when you become resourceful. Oh, so I love that process. Acknowledge it. Experience it. Experience it. Acknowledge Challenge it. it. Challenge it. Mm-hmm. And then be res- resourceful. Then, so when you challenge it, you're going to sometimes, most of the time, see that your fear is based on none of real, if, it's, not, it's not based on anything that is truth. Sometimes it's just things that we pick up as we grow up. So once you realize that your fear is just created in your mind or your fear or your whatever feeling you have a negative emotion, then you're going to move from that negative emotion. Now you have the evidence that is not true. Now you can move to the new emotion. Sometimes we want to move so fast. We want to go from sad to happy. I feel sad right now. I'm just going to tell myself that I'm happy, happy, happy on the mirror, and then I'm going to feel happy. No, because you have to identify What's the belief system that you have that is making you sad? Um, that's what that's behind the emotion is the belief system. So once I understand the belief system, I can challenge that belief system, then I can get rid of it or re- and replace it with a positive one. And then once you get the positive one, let's say that now my thought process about something is like I'm confident. Now I feel confident. Before I did it, now I, f- I feel confident because I went through the whole process. What I'm going to do with that is that now I'm going to bring that into action. I need to create evidence that is possible. Because now that I say that I'm confident, but I don't take action, that's giving me evidence that my former belief was true. Ah. Now that I believe this true, now that I say that I'm confident, I am going to prove myself that I am a confident person. So that's when you have to jump on, you have to do things, because you have to create memories, you have to create a new you have to create evidence that the new belief is real. That makes sense. That makes sense. And I'm guessing that it is speaking to the issues of a lot of people who are listening now. And we talked about this a little bit before. The podcast is for what I call high achieving women. And Mm -hmm. they are the responsible ones, ambitious, and they're doing all the things. 
and to add to it, they published a book. (laughs) 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 And so this podcast is to support them in both professionally and personally. And I can see how what you're talking about with the mindset shift could work in either arena of life. Now, before we talk talk to them about, you know, being an author, let's talk about you as an author. Tell us again about your book and the premise of the book. So the name of the book is Leadership is a Responsibility, How to Become an Inclusive Leader in the Modern Workplace by Understanding the Lived Experiences of Black Women and Afro-Latinas at Work. So I decided to write this book after going through a lot of challenges in my career. And sometimes as when you are working in a predominantly white institution or like you're the minority in that institution, you experience things that other people don't experience. And then once you try to get support or you try to talk to people about what happened to you or what's happening to you, people cannot relate to those experiences. So the more I tried to get support, the more I understood that I was like a person, an alone person in a group. (laughs) And I started thinking to myself, well, all these books that I've read about career development and about leadership, they don't speak about any of the things that I'm seeing right now. I did my master's in leadership. And I learned about team development and I learned about high performance teams and I learned about the importance of leadership, like all of those things. And I was like, I never took a class that touched on microaggressions in the workplace, inclusive leadership, the experiences of minorities in the workplace. It's like none of that was part of the curriculum. So everything that was happening to me, even though I used to teach management, organizational behavior, and I did a master's in leadership and then a doctoral degree that included leadership. And I said, where is all of these things that I'm experiencing? I I cannot be the only one. So then I went out and I first I did my dissertation on the experiences, lived experiences of women in leadership in academia. And the sample I had, most of them were white and there was one black woman. And her experience was very different from everybody else. So that intrigued me too into like, well, she had to do, it felt like she needed to work more in lower level roles and prove herself more than the other people that I interviewed. Like these people, the other people that I interviewed, they had, they, they did like a traditional path. They had their master's degree and then they got a position and then they got another professional development and they got the position. And one of the the black women I interviewed, I remember she said something in the effect of, I did, I, I was, let's say, for example, I was a secretary. I did my degree. I went back to look for a job and I was offered the same position. I was like, how? How are you offered the same position? So they asked, like, requested more things from her. It just looked like it was harder from her for her to get what everybody else got. And that was, looking back, that was before what happened to me. So then this is, I'm, this is our science. You know, sometimes you receive signs from the universe <laughs> of, you know, I wasn't paying attention to this. I'm just listening to her and I'm like, well, you know, and then I started having challenges in my own career and things started showing up such as, you know, at the beginning of your career, people may give you a performance evaluation based on your performance. And then I felt like the more I move on in my career was based on how do other people feel working with me? You know, am I being too confident in meetings? Like it had to do with many vague things that I didn't feel other people that were working in my same role had to deal with. So I interviewed a lot of women in different jobs, a lot of Black women, Afro-Latinas, mothers, and I compiled a lot of their stories and I put it into a book. So the the first part of the book is about my own career trajectory as an Afro-Latina in the United States. And then the second part is about women in the workplace. And I have a chapter on women, Black women, Afro-Latinas, and mothers, because sometimes we don't talk about mothers. We talk about DNI, and I feel like we focus a lot on gender and race. And then I'm I'm saying I'm thinking to myself, like, what about mothers? Mothers go through a lot of biases at work too. So their experiences need to be highlighted. And then the third part of the book is about leadership, how to become an inclusive leadership. So people from different backgrounds, 
it doesn't matter who they are. They can feel like they belong and they can have the same opportunities as everyone else in your company. Yes, that sounds like a, a very uh, necessary and important book to have. And you made the point about mothers in in the context of diversity and inclusion. Say more about that. Like what what um, maybe was one of the biggest surprises or one of the common themes around mothers and inclusion. So around mothers, so research has shown some some research that mothers are passed over for promotions eight out of ten times compared to women without children. And when it comes to the perception of competence, women uh, women with children are pe- perceived less competent than women without children. So what happened with women is that we have to operate in so many different norms that society has assigned to us. And one of those norms is that after you become a mom, you are softer, you don't have time to work, you're, you're tied up. So all of a sudden, your managers are making decisions for you. Like a promotion comes in or opportunity comes in, they immediately assume that because you have children, you will not have time to dedicate to your job, which that is completely untrue because I can, I, I, I was a mother and I used to work so much at my job. And you can have somebody who doesn't have any children and they maybe don't put any like true uh, effort into their job. So to tie your performance based on your life choices is something that is exclusionary. Because, and that's what it bias is. My bias is I'm going to think something of you just because of how you look or your identities, even though I don't know you and I don't know what you're capable of. So when mothers are in the workplace, there is this perception that they don't have time, that they don't want to get promoted, that they are more motherly. So then what happens when you break out of those norms? So let's say I'm a mother and I, let's say I'm not a nurture type, I'm more, how they say it, uh, I'm more directive or, and I like to be assertive. All of a sudden I am violating this social norm that has been assigned for me. And then it's very uncomfortable for other people because people like me shouldn't behave that way. And that is something that holds a lot of mothers back in the workplace is there all of these assumptions that people make about them. And then in addition to that, because society has created this norm that if you have a child, you're the main t- caregiver of that child, not your husband, if you're in a heterosexual relationship, when you want to be ambitious and move up the ladder, sometimes other moms, I mean, other women that had to give up the chance of being mothers because they were focused on their career, sometimes they see you negatively because they're looking at you and they say, well, I had to give a lot of things up. How come you want it all? So you can get it from that, from, from women, and you can get it from men. And it's just, it's, it's very hard. And then you have the guilt. You know, society treats, you know, even right now, I am in a lot of mom's chats and I'm like, where are the dads in the chat? Like, why don't we include the dads too? It's like, you have a child, you put him in school, and it's out of actually, it's, it's, there is the perception that the mother is the one who's going to have time to put a lot of things together, to do all the activities for school and the, and the donations and the bake sale and everything like that. And I'm like, it's the, this is something that starts in society and he goes all the way inside organizations. So what happens in organizations? The women are the ones who are asked to do birthday parties and administrative things. And it's just, it doesn't end. So we need to break all of these biases and assumptions about who we are and what we want to do. <laughs> yes, that makes so much sense. And it reminds me, uh, not too long ago, I was um, at a conference and um, we were looking at research around women and the workforce, basically all things with women, but this one particular segment about women in work. And the woman, one of the women who actually I was doing a live podcast interview at this event. uh, And the woman that I was interviewing, Malika Chopra, was talking about, and she's well known, she's an author, and her father's well known, Deepak Chopra. And in the conversation, she was talking about that morning, before she had to come and speak to this group of 500 people, she had to get the kids up, get the breakfast, take the dog for the walk, 
do all the things and then come and speak to 500 people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know. As an illustration of the the what you're talking about in the roles of women and the expectations um, and mm-hmm. all responsibilities. Okay. All right. So now let's let's talk about the the author, your author self. Let's think about your author self. And from your experience with your book, any any area of the book, it could be from the writing to promoting or to getting it out there in the world. Imagine the woman that I mentioned to you earlier, uh, high achieving, doing all the things, wrote the book. Is there something from your experience that you can uh, share with her that might help her on her journey as an author? Mm-hmm. In addition to all that, what would you say to her? So something that I will tell my high achievers, because I'm type A, high achievers. Sometimes when we're high achieving, we focus a lot on the task, like the task I have. And one of the things that can make a huge difference in your author journey is building relationship with people as you're writing the book. Because sometimes what happens is like, I'm so focused on getting this done because I'm a high achiever and I'm focused on the project. It's a type A, type A person, right? And then you publish the book and you haven't made those relationships for people to promote your book and tell people about your book. So I was lucky that I had made relationship with a lot of people when I used to teach. I used to have 250 students per semester. And a lot of those students and people are on my LinkedIn. So I had, I had, a, a somewhat, you know, for a good amount of followers. And when I published the book and people had followed my stories and things like that, there were people that, you know, shared the book and recommended me for conferences and keynote speaking engagement. And that was great. But I know for a fact that had I worked in developing relationship with a lot of people in the whole process of writing a book, because it might take you a whole year, but imagine if you genuinely talk to people Every single day, or or you post about your author journey every two or three days. This week, I started writing chapter one, and these are my thoughts about chapter one. And you get people to follow you as an author, in addition to follow you as the person who wrote this book. I mean, because you just wrote the book, but they know you more as a person about your journey. I think that will make a huge difference into your success selling those books after you publish them. Makes a lot of sense. It's the power of people. The power. Mm-hmm. Of people. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so as you know, the podcast is Leadership Purpose. So I have yeah. to ask a question about purpose. In your opinion, do you think it's important for you and or others to have uh, at least a sense of purpose or have purpose in their work? And if so, why? And if not, why not? So that is a, such an interesting question because. Uh, when we look at purpose, and I don't know if you watched the movie Soul. I did Disney. see that. I did okay, see that. okay. So he's co- the, you constantly sometimes people search for that purpose. Like, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? What's the purpose? And I will say, like, the purpose for me is, like, to be alive, like, to really live my life. And I think if we can start at least with that purpose, I feel like we can have multiple purposes. So those we say, like, what's my purpose? Like, maybe you have multiple purposes because things build on each other, right? I feel that at least being grateful of being alive, so having the purpose of living a, a great life, then we can add on from there more purposes because then it will be easier for you to find and pinpoint those purposes after you feel grateful about being here. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me. All right. I mean, you've already spent a lot of your time and generous with your your thoughts and time. But is there something that I didn't get a chance to ask you that you want to talk about and share before we tell people how they can get in touch with you and get your book? I would say that if you're going through a difficult moment right now, if you're listening to this podcast and you feel like, you know, things are not going your way or you're not getting the results you want, sometimes having faith in your abilities, like trusting the process more instead of getting to a destination. I know as high achievers, we're really focused on the destination and getting those things done, but sometimes just enjoying the process. Like you may have to write 10 chapters, but what about enjoying writing two pages today? But I enjoy writing those two pages. Read it again. Do you like it? Well, you get 
your book if you were to sell those two pages? Will you be convinced about that after? So really enjoying the process because when we do things with joy, it shows. People yes. notice. Yes, joy. Mm-hmm. I mean, what a better way to end the, the podcast than on joy. All right, so for people who say, how can I hear more and they want to reach you, how can they get in touch with you and or get your book? So in order to get in touch with me for any, um, you can email me at coaching at marisolcapillan.com. You can go to my website, marisolcapillan.com or find me on LinkedIn. I'm always on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to connect with you for virtual coffee. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we'll be sure to put that in the show notes so people could reach out to you. Dr. Marisol, thank you so much for spending your time with us. We appreciate you for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, everyone. And if you want more from me, head on over to my website, robinlowens.com, robinlowens.com. And if you're on socials, you can reach me at pick your favorite one, Robin L. Owens, PhD, Robin L. Owens, PhD. But I must admit, I spend most of my time on LinkedIn. And if you happen to be an author and you're thinking about expanding your book and getting it out there for a broader reach, and you've been thinking about turning it into a course, I have a free training just for you over at Create masterfulcourses.com create masterfulcourses.com and you follow that training and you'll be on your way but until next time this is dr robin thank you for tuning in to this episode of the leadership purpose with dr robin podcast if you enjoyed it head on over and rate and subscribe so you never miss an episode new episodes drop every week and i can't wait to hang out with you again soon Meanwhile, this is Dr. Robin signing off. See you next time.